everyone. Welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder. Today we're going to do Chapter 2 of The Crucifixion of Russia, a new English translation of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, A History of the Russians and the Jews by Columbus Falco, his translation. This will be recording number three. You can find everything we do at VNN Forum dot com permanently archived i also posted at pieville dot net our social medium and i posted on kirksville today dot com but go to vnn forum go to the audio section and you'll find everything that i and some other people have recorded if you want good stuff without the jew unjewed vital aryan documents today chapter two to be slightly shorter perhaps than the first two recordings although roughly similar chapter 2 page 54 under the reign of alexander the first by the end of 1804 the government committee on the jews completed its work and we heard last time about derjavin and his memorandum saying here's what you need to do you know the jews are liquor leasers you the the way to understand it you have polish noblemen at the top they're kind of scummy and lazy and they're renting out they're subcontracting their estates that are full of serfs and the right to essentially farm their serfs tax farm them administrate farm them liquor farm them they're renting this out to jews and the jews are really immiserating uh, that is making life awful for these uh, stupid polacks basically is what it is because i'm not going to absolve whites for blame of for uh, no one forces them to take a drink no one forces them to make stupid business decisions now there may be a degree less freedom of choice among these serfs back then things were more divided into classes and class was not just a social scientist designation but an actual legal thing so maybe there was a little less freedom but still no one can force you to drink and drinking was as big of a problem as anything even perhaps at this point bigger than usury although that was also a big problem Essentially, they were forced to be to share crop on terrible terms. I mean, like worse than you might find down in Alabama. And although sharecropping, whenever you hear about it in U.S. history, is always associated with blacks, there are plenty of white sharecroppers too. There were a lot more white sharecroppers than white slave owners. I'm going to guess, without knowing the actual statistics. By the end of 1804, anyway. So they had a committee to say he wrote the memorandum. Then they set up a committee with them that had a lot of people on it, most of whom were disposed of the Jews. And we heard last time that Derjavin, the Jews actually raised a bunch of money to bribe people not to endorse his recommendations for how to reform the Jews, which amounted to trying to make them more honest and get them out of liquor and the rest of this stuff, make them more civil, essentially an assimilationist program. But as we know, that never works. And the Jews formally responded writing to the czar saying yeah or czarina saying hey we don't uh we're happy doing what we're doing it's working for us yeah why don't you just uh, don't worry about us and they were even prepared if need be to assassinate jerzin but derja derjavin but the committee of you know high high ranking people and derjavin himself derjavin was about the only one pushing for the reform the rest were on the side of the jews for whether legitimately or because they were bribed, and uh, the Tsar coldened, if I may, to Derjavin, and he basically retired after they ignored what he had to say. But anyway, we'll hear a little more about that. By the end of 1804, the Government Committee on the Jews completed its work. The promulgation of the Regulations of 9 December 1804 were Russia's first comprehensive legal attempt to deal with the Jewish question first comprehensive legal attempt to deal with the jewish question 1804 again napoleon is doing the exact same thing just a few years later in france and this is results in the admission of jews as full participating members of western society and within a hundred years they've completely uh, essentially set up what they have now all the, to the extent they could since the technology hadn't been completed but they dominated the papers they dominated the stock market they dominated the professions and they were driving Aryans out and they were discriminating against them so that's the result of making of assimilationist of making of giving Jews full legal rights while also retaining special Jewish privileges this is how insane whites are that they don't protect themselves they don't protect their own they don't even value their own and to the extent they see any difference they're trained by these 
uh, priests to regard it as merely religious. It wasn't until the end of the 1800s you had this beginning of formal scientific, hey, like maybe these are a different species and the problem with them is their inherent traits and were inherently incompatible races, not that they have this or that view in religion. And of course the biological view I've always contended is correct and the religious view is wrong. And it's important to be against Jews for the right reasons, because if you're against them for the wrong reasons, you're simply, what you're doing is not opposing them. You're simply giving them another cover to hide under. Even if you say, we're going to kill you if you don't convert to Christianity, well, that doesn't convert their behavior. To silence a man is not to change his opinion, as, as someone once said. And that's what the conversion of Christianity, the conversos and the, the various terms. And the common people always recognize this because the common people don't have the illusions and the, and the ideology and the self-interest of these liars called priests, who are often pedophiles. They know that the problem with Jews is inherent, and that's just the way they are and the way they behave, and they don't ever change. And that's reflected in giving when the Jews converted, gee, all of a sudden there's these, these if, if, you know, your Uncle Larry or your Aunt Florence converts to Christianity, there's no special name for her other than a uh, former drunk, but, uh, when the Jews convert, all of a sudden you have a name for these names like pigs and sows and, and all these these words that say, yeah, you converted to Jesusism, but you're still this same dirty rat you always were. So it's important to see Jews, for, to acknowledge Jews for what they are and oppose them on that basis. There are different species competing with our species and very effectively until we realize just that and fight back on just that basis. We have to value ourselves. If we don't value ourselves, we're always going to be open to some kind of attack or some kind of persuasion that we're not, well, you're not white. Whiteness doesn't exist, says a famous Catholic apologist ideologue. Whiteness doesn't exist. Nothing in the Bible talks about white people. Well, of course, it's the history of the Jews, even though it's not history, it's fiction. Um, why are we focused on this other race? And it's supposed relation with God. And you start digging into the God and like everything else, the minute you dig into any kind of Jewish history or Jewish claim, it's found to be a, a pot of lies or if there's anything valid and it, it's stolen from someone else. Jews were not monotheistic. They had multiple. <clears throat> Their Yahweh had a girlfriend, in fact. Other people have gone much farther into this, but uh, I'm just telling you that everything Jews claim about themselves in time is revealed to be a lie. And particularly where they claim that they're uh, mistreated or they're abused or whatever, it's always some goyim dared to fight back, even if it was just with words, as with Derjavin. He, he actually tried to be completely fair to the Jews, as Solzhenitsyn observed last chapter, and the result was they tried to bribe people to throw out his recommendations and even were prepared to go so far as to assassinate him. But he got out of the picture shortly after the committee was established, so... As usual, anyone who's Jew critical is driven out of the public eye. Read, they dare to speak out. Don't remember if I made an audio book of that or not, but it's a bunch of people across the spectrum. Cynthia McKinney, a former senator from Illinois, is a Republican, talking about how they're essentially deplatformed after they dare to criticize the ADL or some other group of Jews, uh, Zionists, who are misleading America and uh, using our foreign, our strength to serve Israel rather than the United States. For the 15th time, I'll try to get started here. By the end of 1804, the Government Committee on the Jews completed its work. The promulgation of the regulations of 9 December 1804 were Russia's first comprehensive legal attempt. First comprehensive legal attempt. That's what you would highlight. To deal with the Jewish question. Again, this is in Eastern Europe. Same thing going on in, in the same decade in Western Europe under Napoleon. The committee explained that the concept of population transfer was in the best interest of the Jews themselves and would allow them to prosper, quote, opening the way to only their own benefit and removing anything from the road that can still seduce them. And you'll notice that Aryans at this time are seeing Jews as something, even though you're, you're starting to see a growing demonstration of they have incredible pull and influence, they're still seeing this um, as this small, small group even though they're not counted, of comparatively, if not poor, just sort of shabby people, there's no recognition of the threat this people could be because of their loyalty to each other, one, and their hatred of all others, two. There's not enough recognition of the actual threat that they represent, you see, and we're going to see that in Russia, first and worst, 
you know, 120 years later, after, the, after this stuff, or 110, 15 years later. So, and they're always, we're doing this in the best interest of the Jew. Jews are, of course, never looking out for the best interest of the Goyim, who are there only to serve them, which is their religious ideology. In fact, you shouldn't say religious at all. You should just say ideology. That's their ideology. The regulations establish the principle of civil equality of Jews in Article 42. All Jews living in Russia are free and are made equal under the auspices of the precise laws along with other Russian subjects. So full legal equality, 1804, the promulgation of the regulations of 9 December 1804, full, all Jews living in Russia are free. Again, the serfs are not free, the peasants were not free until later, and are made equal under the auspices of the precise laws along with the other Russian subjects. According to the commentary of Professor Gradovsky in this article, quote, one cannot ignore the desire to merge the people of the entire population of Russia. The regulations opened more opportunities for Jews than the original proposals of Derzhavin. There was the institution of textile and leather factories, as well as the transition to agriculture in undeveloped land, you know, there's a lot of Russia that's not developed, and like the Catherine would bring in Germans uh, and put them out on the river and tell them to hey, use your farming ability to develop this place. So they had a lot of land they wanted to develop. That's what they're always talking about here. You know how big Russia is. And offers of direct state aid. The Jews were given the right to acquire land without serfs on it, but with the right to use hired workers, including Christians. Jewish factory owners, merchants, and craftsmen were now entitled to travel outside the Pale of Settlement, quote, for a while, unquote. The regulations confirmed all the rights of Jews to the inviolability of their property, personal liberty, to maintain their faith and freedom to form community groups, i.e. the Kahal, that is their self-organization as race inside the state, which was left in place without significant changes even though this already undermined the idea of all Russian Jew Jewry citizenship. So they're able to have their eat their cake and have it too. As was the original expression, which again, very few people know if you want to increase your snob factor. Is glory in knowing things wrong? <coughs> I don't know. I believe in morals to an extent. <laughs> That's kind of a joke and kind of a witticism and kind of an epigram. A comprehensive plan. You have to figure out why, though. I can't do all the thinking here. A comprehensive plan for the establishment of Jewish schools was not adopted, but, quote, all the children of the Jews may be admitted and trained without any discrimination from other children in all Russian schools, high schools, and universities. So full formal legal equality and some special privileges to organize as a group within a group. Jewish children attending those schools were not to be proselytized or discriminated against on religious grounds. The regulations considered it necessary for Jews to master the local language, change their appearance and dress, and cooperate in the assignment of new family names for the purpose of a full and accurate census. So they're essentially trying to regularize Jews and drive, drive out anything that makes them different, at least the superficial, the clothing and the language stuff, because Jews had been so under the kahal and under the rabbis and essentially isolated, but now they're going to have a lot more opportunities for swindling. So the Kahal might have been more self-interested instead of seeing what Jews as a whole could do. Maybe there was a bit of a split in the Jews that the Kahal had interests that were not consonant with those of, of the rest of the Jews or not consistent with them. So, but when they're open into full society, maybe the Kahal is still there, but loses a little power. But as a whole, the tribe can greatly increase its uh, opportunities and not, not least, but probably most, for theft and discrimination against others. But they're given last names, they cut off their stupid hair, they dress them like humans, and, uh, hey, we're going to turn them into real Russians. So this, is the, this is the idea that has existed everywhere. It never works. The committee concluded that in other countries, never had been used to this end, means more moderate, more forgiving and more considerate of their, the Jews' concerns. So this is super easy for them. We're, we're being real easy on them. And you, period, Hesa, I have no idea what that is. Why you, period, Hesa, Yehuda or something, Hesa, agrees that 
Russian regulations of 1804 imposed fewer restrictions on Jews, for example, than the Prussian regulations of 1797, more particularly in the fact that Jews acquire and maintain liberty, which at the time did not apply to many millions of serfs in Russia. So they're liberating the Jews before they're liberating their own people. The 1804 law is imbued with tolerance. And notice again this pattern of always, we got to quote Jews saying the same things. To back up my claims, I'm going to quote Jews to prove that what I'm saying is true. This, in my opinion, well, of course, academics like, I don't know if Solzhenitsyn's an academic precisely, but this is more or less an academic form, even though it's unfootnoted. He's doing the same thing McDonald does. It's a little easier to read. McDonald has almost, almost literally every single assertion he makes in his trilogy is backed by a footnote, which really, it's a pure academic approach. So but he does that because he has to do that so that any point that you might care to dispute, he's got proof of someone saying it. And usually, probably 80% of the time, that person is a Jew. So he's using the Jews' own claims to establish the case against the Jews that he wishes to make, which, you know, is uh, essentially group evolutionary psychology. Solzhenitsyn is doing more of a layman's or a, or an acad or a highly intelligent writer's version of the same thing, because whenever he gets into... You know, were they being fair to the Jews? Were they being tolerant? Were they being liberal? Well, here's this Jewish encyclopedia, or here's Hesse, or here's, um, who is the guy, Gessen? Here's Gessen saying exactly what I'm asserting. So you prove it with Jewish sources, but don't think for a moment that will stop Jews from lying about it. They, they will, they will if, just because a Jew, say, a Jew saying something doesn't mean anything. The Jews will say whatever is in their group interest at the time, even if that's a 180 degree reversal. So all you will know, if they have their way, is that Derzhavin was this horrible Jew hater, this anti-Semite, this bogus uh, concept they came up with. So again, the committee concluded that in other countries, never had been used to this end means more moderate, more forgiving, and more considerate of their, the Jews, concerns. And you, or Yehuda Hesse, agrees that the Russian regulations of 1804 impose fewer restrictions on Jews than the Prussian regulations of 1797. So again, not, there's another Napoleon in France, Prussian, Prussian regulations, Russian, all this time, they're all considering how, how are we going to deal with this state within a state and coming up with different uh, legal solutions and social solutions. And they're saying even the serfs were not liberated. They were liberated many decades after the Jews were given full legal equality. The 1804 law is imbued with tolerance. The then widespread magazine Herald of Europe wrote, quote, Alexander knows what evils are attributed to the Jewish nation and that the consequences of this deep-rooted oppression have crushed them in the course of many centuries. Close quote. The purpose of the new law was to give the state of useful citizens and Jews a proper fatherland. However, the most pressing question of all was on the Kagalom, K-A-G-A-L-O-M, and Jewish employees of the Kahal, that is their self-government. The regulations asserted, quote, no Jew in any village may maintain any tavern or inn under his or someone else's identity, nor may any Jew sell brandy or wine or live in the, any village. The law set a date for the removal of Jews from villages outside the Pale of Settlement beginning in 1808. We may remember that such a measure was planned under Paul I in 1797 and before Derzhavin involving the removal of Jews from the villages and replacing them with a more productive class of people. In theory, the Jews were supposed to give up their taverns and distilleries and engage in agricultural work on vacant lands in the Pale and also in New Russia and Astrakhan provinces, see below, and even the Caucasus with a 10-year exemption from taxes and with the right to receive special treasury loans. During the ten favorable years, Jewish land ownership in the Pale expanded significantly. Get on a map and look up where the Pale of Settlement was. On the prohibition of the Jewish trade in alcohol, the committee argued that as long as the monopoly existed, the Jews would continue to be held in hatred and contempt by their fellow citizens. As long as Jews had a monopoly on trading alcohol. Eviction from the villages outside the Pale and compulsion to engage in other, more productive forms of labor, were to the long-term advantage of the Jewish people. Why would anyone seek to maintain only one single monopoly when now land ownership and many other ways of earning a living were open to them, albeit only in the legally designated areas? 
The argument seemed to be weighty. However, Hesse, or Hess of the committee stated that, quote, it is naive to believe that economic effects on the life of a people can be modified by purely mechanical means, by orders. You can't just inorganically change us from what we are, scumbags, into healthy plants. On the Jewish side, there were protests against the planned expulsion from the villages and the compulsory secular occupation of the Jews as horrible and cruel, and the 1804 law was still being condemned a century and a half later as such by Jewish historians. The screeching and the whining never end. And always let us follow Tan Staffel in using screeching to describe the emissions of Jews through their northern cloaca, as it were. Almost immediately after the regulations of 1804, the European situation encroached on Russia and war began to loom with Napoleon. The Jews of Russia were fascinated with Bonaparte and the complete liberation of Jews, which he had decreed in France. And remember, he was going to go down to the Holy Land and liberate them. We've heard about it in E. Michael Jones. He didn't quite make it. Giving them full civil rights, as he did in, in France, without compelling them to do any physical labor and allowing them to work at non-strenuous, purely administrative and economic occupations. Napoleon established a Jewish Sanhedrin, that is a council, a gathering of the rabbis, in Paris to act as a kind of early European-wide council for Jewish affairs, under French tutelage, of course, and Russian Jewry participated in this. In 1806, Alexander I created a new committee to consider the advisability or otherwise of delaying the relocation of Russia's Jews within the Pale of Settlement. The expulsion of the Jews from the villages laid down by the 1804 law was originally to be completed by 1808, but there were practical difficulties, and in 1807, Alexander submitted a memorandum on the need to postpone the eviction. At the same time, the Tsar issued a royal decree that allowed all of Jewish society to elect a body of deputies to assist in the successful execution of the 1804 regulations. These elections of deputies in the Jewish of the Jewish western provinces were held, and the responses were presented to St. Petersburg in various attempts to delay the eviction indefinitely. One major consideration was that Jewish tavern keepers were currently receiving free living accommodation from the landlords from whom they leased their premises, while in towns and cities they would have had to pay rent. So yeah, of course they don't want to give this up. They have free non-working income, basically, from running the distilleries and, and taverns and such, and they have free living accommodations. The interior minister reported that the resettlement of Jews from their present villages of residence would need several decades due to their large numbers. By 1808, the political situation and military threat to Russia from events in Europe was such that Alexander temporarily suspended the key articles, commanding the Jews to relocate and forbidding them to engage in the alcohol trade until further notice. As a stopgap in 1809, so see again, again, notice the pattern that ideas are put forward, Jews reject them, and people bribed by the Jews or friendly to them reject it. Even where the laws are put in place, they're quickly, they're either not enforced or they're repealed or both, typically. Hard to make stuff stick against the Jews unless that's more or less the point of the whole thing that you're doing and you're not worried about much else. As a stopgap in 1809, the Tsar established yet another committee under Senator Popov for studying the whole range of Jewish issues in conjunction with the elected Jewish deputies. Unsurprisingly, after three years in 1812, this body presented a report to the throne recommending that the expulsion of the Jews to the Pale of Settlement be suspended and that Jews be allowed to continue to lease taverns and trade in alcohol. Alexander I did not approve the report, since he did not want arbitrarily to throw out the pre previous laws of 1804, and he remained steadfast in his desire to protect the Russian peasant from Jewish predation. He declared himself ready to soften the regulations somewhat, but not to abandon them entirely. But then events intervened in the form of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, the massive and total eviction of all Russian Jews and their resettlement in outlying areas as envisioned by the 1804 law never took place, although the process was briefly attempted and did proceed slowly and sporadically through the remainder of the 19th century. See below. 
end of that subtitle, the Jews and the Napoleonic invasion. So again, Napoleon tries to settle this, is much more notable than the Russians, but they're all trying to do it at the same time. The Jews and the Napoleonic invasion, the bottom of page 58. During the 1812 invasion, in some locations, the Jews were the only residents who did not flee the French army into the woods or elsewhere. So the Jews are prepared to celebrate this guy who they think will give them even more than what they had from these liberal Russians, just as they were welcomed their brothers in Russia once the USSR uh, had revolted, coming into their Eastern European, coming to the Western Eastern European lands uh, in World War II, because they know that they're their Jewish buddies, the communists are going to uh, discriminate in their favor. So during the 1812 invasion of, of Napoleon into Russia, in some locations, the Jews were the only residents who did not flee the French army into the woods or elsewhere. And of course, the Russians, the actual Russians are going to notice this. These Jews refused to join Napoleon's army as soldiers, but supplied the French troops with forage and provisions unquestioningly. In other areas, Jewish merchants assisted the Russian military through allowing them to use, quote, Jewish mail. A private, unquote, a private network of couriers and postal stations in taverns that transmitted information with unprecedented speed. And see, this is the Jews working as a tribe. They have a Jewish internet or a Jewish uh, Pony Express before anyone else. And of course, this is how Rothschild famously bet on the Battle of Waterloo and got rich in the stock market knowing the actual result and pretending the opposite, because Jews have a, have a network of Jews, and again, they're merchants and traders. They have vast, far-flung networks, and every tiny little cell communicates with every other, so they really are like a cancer network operating in the body area of the different uh, European nations. A private network, Jewish mail, in quotes, a private network of couriers and postal stations and taverns that transmitted information with unprecedented speed. Individual Jews were sometimes used as couriers for communication between the units of the Russian army, since they could pass through French-held territory more easily than military riders. When the Russian army returned after beating back the French, most of the Jews made a great show of enthusiastically welcoming the Russian troops, giving them bread and wine. Even the future Nicholas I wrote in his diary, it is surprising that in 1812, they, the Jews, were perfectly true and even helped where they could with danger to their own life. Well, they're, they're always going to go. See, they're going to be sycophantic uh, when they have to be. It's not a principle with them. Like us, we feel we should feel or we have felt until we became Christianized. We felt embarrassed at being cucks. But to Christians, being a cuck is a way of life, an ideology, even a morality. There are no cucks who are not Christians. Um. <coughs> But Jews are willing to turn, they turn as the circumstances dictate. They're very instrumental. Their ideology is to survive and exist as Jews, and they may be willing to die as a Jew, but uh, if, if they can gain power some other way of fawning on someone because they don't have enough power yet, yet their design remains. The, the, the white cucks in Congress, their, their desire is not to take over and change things. They're not being sycophantic for that reason. They are purely careerists. That's the difference in two people who might be acting the same way, but they have different things ultimately driving them. They're all, they all have their careers, their personal interests. They're not there for uh, trumping for any race or ideology. They are there for themselves. Disloyalty is, is almost defines them, and they, they even expect this. And this is, this is why Trump can do everything that he does. He can betray his wife. He can betray any expressed principle, anything he says at all of his mass rallies. He can never do it. And yet the people won't abandon him because they, they understand how it is. Everyone's out for himself and betrayal is the name of the game. And Trump's not any, any worse than the other side. He's a little bit better. So they constantly forgive betrayal. When you forgive betrayal, you're subsidizing it. You're going to get more of it. This is a problem that Jews have overcome that our people have not. And that ability to overcome disloyalty and to achieve actual, actual real-world loyalty is what has led Jews to the top. Below that, only there is only valuing themselves. We don't value ourselves. We let other people, oh, no, no, the good thing about you is you believe in Jesus Christ, the Jew. Really? And 
<laughs> and his fib fooled the child. With the cessation or with the cession to Russia after 1814 of central Poland, the empire acquired more than 400,000 more Jews, and the Jewish problem for the Russian government worsened accordingly. Remember, earlier, last time we heard, they would acquired a million Jews. As they get these new lands, they get these Jews, they get a bigger problem. Indigestion. In 1816, the Council of State of the Kingdom of Poland, which still existed, decided to begin the expulsion of Jews from the villages, allowing Jews to remain only for direct agricultural work without the help of Christians. But the Warsaw Kahal appealed immediately to the Russian emperor, and Alexander released the Jews who had been put to manual labor and confirmed the right of the Jews to engage in commerce and to trade in vodka. It what they do, these pizza rats. However, in the Senate rules of 1818, Jewish leas leasers and liquor sellers were again excoriated in the Senate rules of 1818. The Jews were accused of forcing Russian peasants into lifelong debt, keeping the peasants drunk and poor, taking their cattle and tools in exchange for liquor. During those years, the future Decemberist Pestel, P-E-S-T-E-L, served in the Russian army in the western provinces, i.e. Poland. Certainly no defender of autocracy and an ardent Republican, Pestel wrote some of his observations about the Jews he studied. Pestel, quote, waiting for the Messiah, the Jews consider themselves temporary townsfolk where they are, and therefore do not want to engage in agriculture or artisanship, and are for the most part engaged in selling merchandise. Jewish clerics called rabbis contain their people in isolation by forbidding in the name of faith ever reading any books but the Talmud, this is why they had no culture. People who will not seek enlightenment will always remain under the power of prejudice. The dependence on Jewish rabbis is so ingrained that every order is executed faithfully and unquestioningly. The close relationship between Jews gives them the means to accumulate large sums of money for their common needs, particularly for the corruption of various rulers to covetousness and to all kinds of abuse. For them, the Jews are useful. They easily become sovereign in those provinces where they have their residence. All trade is in their hands, and there is little that peasants who have no means of paying their debts can do. The former government, that of Catherine, gave them many different rights and benefits, reinforcing the evil that they do, such as the right not to give recruits to the army, exemption from military drafting, the right not to declare the dead, the right to sue each other in their own rabbinical courts, and moreover, they enjoy all of the same rights as Christian nations. They constitute a special and completely separate state. And the fact is that in Russia today, they have more rights than Christians themselves. This state of affairs, notice how they say Christians rather than Russians. This state of affairs cannot, they're still defining Jews as religion. This state of affairs cannot continue as it condones the hostile attitude of the Jews to the Christians and put them in a position contrary to public orders in the country. And see, this is why, this is why uh, this mistake of seeing the Jews as religion, they're, they're, rather than racial, is ingrained at this point. It hasn't changed until the later 1800s, but it's an essential thing to see that the problem is religious. When Jews take power, sometimes they will ban churches for a time. But currently in the West, everywhere, you can go to a Christian church, whereas you cannot get anything relational and usually not even something weakly conservative on the airwaves without being banned or thrown in jail. So the attack is absolutely racial, and not acknowledging that is a large part of what helps the attack to secede, and certainly what prevents us from coming together to defend ourselves. Anyway, that was a brilliant statement. I think that was better than uh, Derjavin stuff, and that came from Pestel, describing basically, yeah, they're a state within a state. They get their, they get special benefits. They have all the rights of everybody else, and they have special benefits on top of it, and they're doing nothing but uh, supporting our people into drunkenness and, and other misery. Subtitle, The Last Years of the Reign, page 61. In the last years of the reign of Alexander I, there were general economic and other prohibitions against Jewish activities, 
Golitsyn reported to the Committee of Ministers that, quote, Christians are living in the homes of the Jews, not just forgetting and living without fulfilling the duties of the Christian faith, but taking the customs and rituals of Jewish worship. The decision was taken to prohibit Jews to take in servants of the Christian faith. It was considered that, quote, it would be good for the poor Jews who could replace Christian servants. However, this did not happen, and no wonder. In the Jewish city there was mass poverty and misery, urban Jews being mostly poor, barely earning their livelihood, but never was the opposite was observed. The Jews did not go into home service for Christians. And again, remember, the, the National Socialist in Germany uh, forbid Christians for working for Jews in that, in that kind of guise, particularly working as their house servants. From 1823, Christians were allowed to rent property to Jews in the case of tax farmers only. There were, as always, endless loopholes around the law. In many cases, the law was simply ignored, and strict observance of the ban was almost never carried out in practice. So in Russia, law doesn't really mean that much, at least as pertains to Jews. We can clearly see that. Again, notice the pattern. Objections to Jews arise. They're always the same objections. If, if they result, if they culminate in any kind of a law, accumulate in any kind of a law, the law is ignored. Uh, that's the pattern. In those same years, in response to the rapid development of the sect of Subotniks in Bronej, Samara, Tula, and other provinces of the Pale, steps were taken to suppress the worst Jewish abuses. For example, in 1821, the Jews who were charged with, quote, grievous bondage of peasants and Cossacks, that's a direct quote, grievous bondage, were expelled from the rural areas of Chernigov province, and in 1822, from the villages of Poltava. Again, if you're going to be listening to all these, I recommend you get a map of Russia and really just take five minutes and just look it over and see where all this stuff is. Now, I'm hardly an expert that just by reading the place names, I can explain where they are, but I, I'm going to do that myself. I, I'm embarrassed I haven't done it yet, uh, but I should have. And re refresh my mind on where exactly the Pale of Settlement is and the various rivers and, and some of these towns. But the key is you get the pattern. I don't think you need to be a student of history. What a stupid phrase that is. But you need to you need to go to it to history uh, to learn about certain individuals and, and their greatness, what made them great. That's important. And also, to, more important, just to see the patterns of things. And once you get the pattern, you can pretty much bet that it's going to carry on in the current day. Beyond that, you may just have an interest in it. I wouldn't say I don't particularly. Um... But getting the pattern right is, is in, and the arguments, the arguments, the evidence you need for arguments to uh, get white race on the right track. Just as we get our diet on the right track, we have to get our minds on the right track about who we are. Okay, who are we? What happened to us? What, what are we now? Why are we in the position we're in now? What can we do from this position going forward? What kind of goals do we want to reach as a race? How do we get there? Again, they're blending uh, philosophical and instrumental questions. Now, so, you know, they keep being accused of your harassing, your oppressing the peasants. In 1824, when riding in the Ural mountain range on a botanical expedition, Tsar Alexander I noticed a significant number of Jews who engaged in the secret purchase of precious metals, corrupting local inhabitants to the detriment of the treasury and private investors. They similarly undermined the treasury by engaging in widespread smuggling along the western border of Russia, transportation of goods and products in both capital and in trade. Governors denounced them, asserting that smuggling involved mostly Jews, especially in densely populated border strips. So essentially the pale is almost kind of like a little Israel and they're fanning out from there and doing their dirty work and maybe running back is what I'm suspecting. Again, there when you have a pattern, you have knowledge when you can predict things. That doesn't mean like predict absolutely the price. It means when you can pr predict an outcome, you have a valid theory that helps explain what's going to happen, not when you do what most people do, which is look backward and claim you knew it all the time. That's common, low, and more. most importantly, that's wrong. That's not the way to do it. A theory, under when you understand Jews, you can predict their behavior in the general. 
well, they're going to, they're going to like today, what do we know? Well, they're going to sex farm children and steal stuff. And then if they're caught, they're going to do less or no time. They're going to be pardoned instead of being executed. But if they can, they're going to flee to Israel. Well, if they do that today, what would they have been doing back then? Well, what did they have to work with? They had a pale of settlement. Now they're allowed full legal equality, at least in a lot of areas. So you would think they could fan out, maybe go where they're not supposed to, do what they're not supposed to do, then maybe run back to the pale. Or maybe since they have this network of Jewish mail, they can communicate, they can, hey, you know, Bar von Theftim needs to flee Russia and run over to Paris, you know, and they communicate this through their network and get one of their guys out of town. So understanding the Jew, you can predict how the Jew will behave. So it is with every everything and everyone. So they undermine the treasury by engaging in widespread smuggling along the western border of Russia, transportation of goods and products in both capital and in trade. Governors denounce them, asserting that smuggling involved mostly Jews, especially in the densely populated border strips. In 1816, there was an order issued in Volin province completely to evict all Jews from a 50-verst border strip. I don't know what verst is, some Russian measure of land. The eviction from this province lasted five years and was considered only partially successful. From 1821 on, the new governor allowed the Jews to return. In 1825, a government resolution was held in common, but was much more cautious. Only those Jews who had not been assigned to a local kagalom would be subject to expulsion or, or who had property in the border that could be used as bases for smuggling. However, the measure was not carried out consistently. So, they, again, they keep passing laws to reform the Jews or to guard against them, and they keep not being enforced. The New Russia Experiment, midway on 62. At the time of the regulations of 1804, when the clear intention was to evict Jews from the villages of the sensitive and potentially dangerous western provinces, the government... The governmental authorities asked the question, where to relocate them? Cities and towns were already densely populated, and this was exacerbated by the fierce competition in petty trade at a very weak point in the development of productive labor. Meanwhile, the vast south of Ukraine was sparsely populated, almost empty. It made obvious sense to evict from the villages the unproductive Jewish mass and turn them to agriculture in what was called New Russia. Ten years earlier, Catherine tried to implement this idea, including a double tax to encourage Jewish emigration, but this measure failed because there was no accurate census or counting of the numbers and whereabouts of the Jewish population. The Jews were known only by first names or nicknames, and the Kahal hid almost half the Jewish population from the authorities. Now 30,000 acres of land were specifically allocated solely for the use of Jews, as an initial land grant with the possibility of further grants based on need. The government offered generous benefits for immigrants. In New Russia, Jews could receive hereditary possession, not ownership, for a family of 40 tithes. The Russian average peasant allotment was a few tithes, rarely as much as 10. Cash loans for relocation and device management, the purchase of livestock, equipment, and so on, Loans repayable only after 10 years, and a preliminary construction of chopped timber huts for immigrants. In this area, not only all poor men, but even some landowners lived in adobe houses. So, very, very favorable. To, hey, hey, look, they're basically like giving them like, you know, in the American West, like homesteading. Hey, if you just, you know, if you go out here, we'll give you loans, we'll give you buildings, we'll even make you a little hut. Uh, you don't have to pay back the loan for 10 years. Uh, you we're giving you a really good start, and you can uh, you can have an honest occupation. The Jews, are, no, thank you. They don't want that. They want to keep tax farming, leasing liquor, distribution. They want to keep doing usury. Why wouldn't they? Farming is actual work. It's hard. Enlightened Jewish figures, while still very few, Notkin, Levinson, he has in parentheses also supported the government's initiative and were reasonably aware of the need for the Jewish people to move to productive work, although they emphasized that this should be achieved by measures of encouragement rather than coercion, carrot rather than stick. The epic of Jewish agriculture in Russia is presented in bulky and painstaking labor by the Jew Vien Nik Nikitin. So again, the honest Aryan citing Jew sources to prove his points that Jews will whine about, he knows, beforehand who devoted many years to the study, this 
Nikitin, N-I-K-I-T-I-N. Nikitin devoted many years to the study of the vast and unpublished archives of the official correspondence in Petersburg on the subject of Jewish settlement in New Russia. All this is abundantly represented in his book, with layered sets of documents and statistics from multiple sources, and sometimes contradictory reports from inspectors over a period of many years, overly rich for our very brief overview of the material here. Nikitin admits that the government's goal, besides the problem of development of vast uninhabited land, was to settle Jews and to bring them into productive physical labor and to remove them from the, quote, bad trades, unquote, in which they had for so many years inflicted misery on the peasants and the serfs. Quote, the government invites them to apply themselves to agriculture with a view to improving their own life. But if there's one truth through history, Jews are not interested in agriculture. The Jews were not lured by the promises of the government and, on the contrary, evaded resettlement by a variety of means. The resettlement idea was essentially benevolent in intention, but it was not in conformity with the desires of the Jews themselves and was, frankly, beyond the limited organizational capabilities of the Russian administration. It was reserved for the Jews in the new Russia tithing, capital on the T, and then for decades kept inviolable just for them. Publicist I.G. Orsha, O-R-S-H-A, later expressed the proposition that Jewish agriculture could only be successful through the transfer of state-owned land to the Jews right there nearby in Belarus, in the villages where they had lived before. However, there simply wasn't enough state land in Belarus for the purpose. For example, in Grodno province, there were only 20, there were only 200 tithes of state land and this poor and infertile soil where the entire population suffered from crop failure. However, the Jews were not in a hurry to become farmers. Only three dozen families applied to move to New Russia. The hope of the Jews was that their eviction from their villages in the western region, i.e. Poland, would be delayed or canceled or simply forgotten. They were given a three-year term to relocate under the regulations of 1804, but still delayed, and migration did not start. As the fateful deadline of January 1st, 1808 approached, a kind of rush developed, especially since rumors of profitability had grown. Now a few Jews began to apply, although nowhere near the entire Jewish population of Belarus. Some even secretly went in groups without permission and even without the passport. The Kherson office, K-H-E-R-S-O-N, of trustees for Jewish settlers had not had time to build houses, dig wells, and step distance created a lack of master craftsmen. So they're basically farming them out along the river plains where they're not developed. So we can kill two birds with one stone. We can develop these outer reaches of our empire, and we can also turn the Jews to productive activity. But they didn't have enough time even to get the basics in place. The government did not stint any money or reasonable accommodation or sympathy for the settlers, but the governor of Richelieu in 1807 asked St. Petersburg to limit the pace of an introduction to 200 to 300 families per year, and only to receive those who were able to move at their own expense. In the case of crop failure, the state fed these people for several years in a row. Poor settlers received daily food. However, the governors of the western region began randomly expelling Jews from their territories and losing track of how many had been expelled, and many Jews who were allegedly bound for settlements in New Russia simply disappeared along the way into the cities or shtetls of the countryside. The immense distances on the Ukrainian steppe, where there could be up to 300 miles from the office to the colony, made it almost impossible for the authorities to exercise any control or even to make any accurate assessment of over how many and who was arriving. Little point in making laws that there's no real way to enforce or even to, even to determine if enforcement is needed or compliance is happening. There was a lack of housing, wells, and facilities. Lack of accurate administration, correct accounting, and distribution led to the fact that some settlers received more than others. They complained about the non-receipt of feed and loans. The small colony caretakers were unable to function. Flip to 66. Rangers were paid a miserable wage. They often did not have horses and had to try to operate on foot. 
In many cases, after two years at the New York location, the settlers had no economy, no crops, and no food. There were problems with the settlers' land titles. Records keeping on deductions and loans was a shamble. Loan money disappeared, and so did many of the Jewish settlers who appeared in the colonies, got whatever they could get by way of loans or goods from the government, and then fled to nearby cities where they loitered and resumed their former habits of money lending, liquor selling, merchandising, and other wanted trades minimal on physical labor. Many offices and inspection reports reflect how the new settlers were farming. The settlers claimed to be completely ignorant of the most basic principles of agriculture, and the state ended up hiring Russian peasants to teach them how to farm. Jews were given special allocations of seed grain that were either wasted or sold. They were given agricultural implements that they broke or sold. They slaughtered their cattle for food, then complained about the lack of cattle. Again, that old orphan joke. Many Jews got their start as auctioneers and livestock brokers through the selling off of their own livestock given to them by the government. The homes provided for them by the government were not maintained, and they were illegally sold to Russian peasants. Many complained that they did not expect they themselves would certainly be forced to engage in agricultural work, but obviously they understood corn hired workers. <coughs> but obviously they understood corn corn hired workers, cattle markets, and trade fairs, so they naturally go to the middleman position, the broker. They don't do the work that they take a cut of the profit. Settlers continued to beg for help from the treasury. They complained they had no clothing, but government inspectors stated that this was because they would not keep sheep or sow hemp, and Jewish women either could not or would not spin or weave. In his report, one of the inspectors stated that, quote, the Jews cannot cope with the economy of the worry-free life due to small diligence and inexperience in rural work. However, he considered it appropriate to add, quote, one ought to prepare for agriculture from a young age, and Jews 45 and 50 years old who have lived a pampered life cannot soon make farmers. The fiscal expenditures required to maintain the settlers doubled and tripled, and the local officials were all the time requesting supplements. St. Petersburg determined that many of the problems came down to the fact that Jews intentionally evaded tillage. The influx of Jewish settlers on the public expense in the new Russia, out of control and failing miserably, was temporarily suspended in 1810, after coming into effect in name in 1808. In 1811, the Senate restored the right of Jews to sell wine in the state-owned villages repurchased in the Pale, and when it was learned in New Russia, the news caused many who had migrated to New Russia to leave and return to where they came, and many others to open illegal taverns and establish illegal alcohol trades in New Russia itself. By 1812, it was revealed that already out of a settlement of 848 families left, there were 538 absences in 88 families where Jews had gone to Kherson, Nikolaev, Odessa, even Poland. The government understood that this program was a debacle and probably would have given up on the project sooner than it did had there been some reliable way to recover the vast sums of money they had spent on trying to relocate the Jews and turn them into farmers. How to ensure the return of the treasury debt to those who would be allowed to switch occupations from being farmers, how to fix, without burdening the treasury, the shortcomings of these people who remain farmers, and how to achieve the central goal of changing the character of the Jewish people in dealing with the problem they represented to Russian society? Question mark. Neglect, absence, delay, and the delivery of grain or funds. Jews who sold property they had been given to start new lives with, as well as abuse for, such as bribery for permission for a long absence, even for the main workers in the family, which caused the destruction of the economy immediately. So they made no honest attempt at becoming farmers. They simply went out there to get the loans and the stuff, and they immediately sold it or, uh, and went back to their usual trade. In the state of the Jewish colonies after the 1810 to 1812, it is hard to see improvement. Oxen, livestock, and implements were sold or abused or broken. Fields were sown late and thin and as close to as possible to their homes. Other fields were sown five or more years in a row and no potatoes were planted to replace bread. Year after year, local authorities reported crop failures or, quote, seed not collected. Under the terms of the regulations, a bad harvest meant settlers would be entitled to absence in order to work elsewhere. Jews did not cherish their livestock. Oxen were used to pay rent. 
with the bulls were hired out for carting, cattle were starved and then slaughtered for food, and claims for compensation put into the government claiming the animals had died of disease. The Jewish settlers refused to take the most basic care of their property or animals. Quote, they do not care to have a strong barn or pen to which to divert the cattle at night. It would be difficult. At night, they indulge in endless sleep. Shepherds are children or lazy, and on holidays and even Saturday, they drive all without shepherds and will not even try to catch thieves. They murmur against their co-religionists, who work hard and bring in excellent harvests, lest the authorities say this shows the ability of Jews to do agriculture and compel them to engage in it. So they could do it, they don't, just don't want to. They, quote, do not fit with the agriculture. They set out secretly to practice as little arable farming as they can, so as to give the appearance of failure that they might be allowed to return to the sale of wine, again allowed to their co-religionists back in old Russia. Cattle, tools, and seed they buy several times, again and again, to lend to feed. Quite many of them, getting a loan, and regardless of the masters, are in the village just in time for cash distributions, and then go without money to county towns and villages for fisheries. Others endowed with land sold it, and albeit in vagrancy, lived in Russian settlements for several months, sometimes with passports missing. That unsettled Israel Levka Kherson province, quote, its settlers considered themselves entitled to engage in fisheries and settled only to enjoy the benefits, unquote, of the 32 families who lived on the site of 13. Numerous inspections noted the absence of female Jewish agricultural workers. When Jewish women married, their parents entered into conditions with a prospective bridegroom that did not force them either to heavy field work or even to carry water or daub huts. Hired workers would do this. Jewish husbands were also contractually bound to procure for them to procure them ornaments for the holidays, fox and rabbit fur bracelets, hats, and even pearls, things of luxury and extravagance such as silk, silver, and gold. These conditions forced the young people to meet the whims of their wives to the ruin of their farms, while other settlers did not have winter clothes. Marriage took place too early, significantly sooner among the Jews than among other peasants. Large, extended families created all living in the same house, created untidiness of life and scurvy. But some women did marry commoners and leave the settlements. In numerous denunciations from Jewish settlers from different colonies were heard repeated complaints that prairie land was so solid that it required four pairs of oxen to plow, the frequent crop failures, the lack of water, lack of fuel, poor, pernicious climate leading to disease, to hail, locusts. There was some truth to this, but much exaggeration as well. Settlers with the smallest of grievances immediately complained and always increased their claims, but when they were right, they were comp compensated. However, as we turn on to 70, says Nikitin, in the same wilderness, in the same years, the same virgin soil, under the same locust, German colonists and Mennonites and Bulgarians prospered. But the Germans are the best farmers in the world, of course. At least by comparison to the Jews. They suffered the same lean years, the same disease, but they always had bread and cattle, lived in clean and attractive houses with many outbuildings, ample gardens and greenhouses. The difference was so striking that individual German colonists were invited to live in the Jewish colonies that they might pass on the experience and set an example. The Russian peasant, says Nikitin, by way of explanation, remember Catherine brought a bunch of Germans into, under the Volga to settle. The Russian peasant, says Nikitin, by way of explanation, quote, gravitated over them the yoke of serfdom. They took everything stoically and demolished any adversity. Jewish colonists bailed out everywhere. They attracted runaway serfs who were paid by the settled colonists. Farmer Jews took in vagabonds with affection and greetings for the tramp who willingly helped them to plow, sow, and reap, and some, to better hide, even joined the Jewish religion. These cases were detected, and in 1820, the government forbade Jews to take Christians into their service, always trying to get someone else to do their actual work, whether it's fighting wars or even tilling the soil. 
Meanwhile, in 1817, the 10-year tax exemption for Jewish settlers ended, and now the time had come to equalize them in taxes with the state peasants. Immediately, a movement had started of settlers collected pensions, but also among officials requesting an extension of benefits for another 15 years. Always they have to have special privileges. Golitsyn, a personal friend of Alexander I, the Minister of Education and Religious Affairs, who dealt with all matters relating to the Jews, made a decision. Golitsyn made a decision to extend the Jews' tax exemption for five years and the payment of the debt for the loan to 30 years. Essentially, the Jews are getting free money just to act like non-niggers, and they refuse. Nikitin found these petitions by the Jewish colonists, quote, extremely characteristic in their content. Oh, he's starting to notice there's something racial about it, maybe. In 1807, Ilyar Menashe, Menashe, a prominent Talmudic scholar, but also a champion of education, published and sent to rabbis his book, soon withdrawn from circulation by the rabbinate, and next subject to mass burning, in which he noted the dark side of Jewish life. Again, Ilyar Menashe. There was poverty and unusually large families, but, quote, could it be otherwise when the mouths of the Jews were more than their hands? It is necessary to convince the mass of Jews that their own work should produce their own livelihood. Young people do not have any earnings, yet they marry, hoping for the mercy of God and the purse law. And when the support is crumbling, they are already burdened with families. They rush to the first available activity, even if not honest. Crowds take up trade, but it cannot feed all, and therefore it is necessary to resort to deception. That is why it is desirable that the Jews turn to farming. Bums under the mask of scholars live at the expense of charity and at the expense of the community. There is nobody to take care of the people. The rich are busy thinking about profit, and the rabbis, the strife between the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim, or Orthodox Jews, and the only concern of the Jewish leaders is to prevent bad luck in the form of government regulations, even if they carry with them the benefit of the people. And now, quote, the existence of a significant Jewish population serves as a small commercial and industrial and intermediary activity. Jews overly fill the cities with petty trade. And how could it be healthy, the economy of the Jewish people, in such circumstances? So, a Jew named Menashe in 1807 is admitting a lot of the, the negative stuff. Like, they, they need to do something honest like the farming. It could work, but they're not going to allow it. They don't want to do it. They're just bad people. Or they're just a different type of people, was the racial view. It wouldn't affect us if we didn't allow them to live among us, would it? However, a later Jewish author, already in the middle of the 20th century, wrote about that time, quote, It is true that Jewish masses lived in poverty and distress, but the Jewish collective as a whole was not a beggar. They saw the life of Jews in the western provinces, participants in Napoleon's army in 1812, just passed through these places. Under Dakshisi, spelling question, Jews were, quote, rich and prosperous. They conduct major trade with the whole of Russian Poland and even visit the Leipzig trade fair. The Jews had the right to produce alcohol and vodka and honey. They were tenants or owners with taverns located on the main roads. The Jews of Mogilev were prosperous and conducted extensive trade, although, quote, along with them, they were, were the terrifying poor, unquote. Almost all the Jews had patents on the trade in alcohol. More from a third-party witness, quote, in Kiev, countless Jews. The common feature of Jewish life was satisfaction, although not universally, says Solzhenitsyn. So some were poor, but overall they were not beggars, they were not poor, and most of them were doing well. From psychological and domestic point of view, observers found Russian Jewry characterized by, quote, constant vigilance to his fate and identity, to his struggle and self-defense. The, quote, domineering and authoritative social forms for the preservation of life, unquote, were prominent in them. Adaptation to the new conditions of life was largely a collective adaptation and not individual. And we need to appreciate the organic coalescence and unity, which the first half of the 19th century gave Russian Jewry a definable character in the world, 
This world was too small, limited, and subject to harassment associated with suffering and hardship, and yet to them it was the whole world. Man there is not choked. <clears throat> it was possible in this world to feel the joy of life to be found in it, to find material and spiritual sustenance, and it was possible to build a life in it to taste and mood. The value here was the fact that the spiritual aspect of the team had been associated with traditional scholarship and the Jewish language. Over to 73. Another author of the same collection of accounts of Russian Jewry noted that, quote, injustice, material poverty, and social humiliation hampers the growth of self-esteem among the people, close quote. Like almost every question related to Judaism, it is difficult, and the picture presented here is of those years. We should never lose sight of this complexity and always keep it in mind, undeterred by apparent contradictions between different authors. Once, before the expulsion from Spain, Judaism marched in front of other people on the path of progress. Eastern European Judaism now came to the first half of the 18th century to complete cultural impoverishment. Disenfranchised, and isolated from the outside world, it withdrew into itself. The Renaissance passed without affecting it, as did the intellectual movements of the 18th century in Europe. But this Jew was strong within himself, bound by countless religious prescriptions and prohibitions. A Jew was not only burdened by them, but also saw them as a source of endless joy. His mind found satisfaction in the small dialectics of the Talmud in the sense of mysticism of Kabbalah. Even Bible study receded into the background, and knowledge of grammar was almost considered a crime. This is how anti-intellectual these, these Russian Jews really were. The Progress to Modern Education. This may be the last subtitle. Yes, it is, of this chapter, too. A strong movement of Jews toward modern education began in Prussia with the second half of the 18th century. This became known as the Haskalah, the Enlightenment. It was a movement of intellectual awakening, the desire to ingest a European education and raise the prestige of the Jews, humiliated in the eyes of other nations. At the critical study of the historical past of the Jews, Haskalah figures, <coughs> Maskilim, enlightened ones, wish to combine Jewish culture harmoniously with the European knowledge. Initially, they intended to stay in traditional Judaism, but fascinated, began to sacrifice the Jewish tradition, and became inclined to assimilate while showing contempt for the national language, i.e. Yiddish. In Prussia, the movement lasted only one generation, but quickly moved to the Slavic provinces of the Austrian Empire, Bohemia and Galicia. In Galicia, always known for particularly scummy Jews, the champions of the Haskalah, with even greater assimilation bias, were ready to enforce a lot of Jewish education, and even often resorted to the help of the authorities for this. The border of Galicia with the western provinces of Russia leaked people and influences, so the Enlightenment starting to go from Russia and Western Europe into Eastern Europe. With a delay of almost a century, this movement penetrated into Russia. In Russia, since the beginning of the 19th century, the government strove for the Jews to overcome isolation outside of religion and worship. A Jewish author confirmed that the government in no way violated the religion of the Jews or their religious life. We have already seen the position of 1804 swing open without restrictions and without reservation all the way for Jewish children in schools, high schools, and universities. But the Jewish ruling class intended to destroy cultural and educational reform in the bud, and bent to this effort. The Kahal exerted strenuous efforts to extinguish the slightest glimmer of enlightenment. In order to preserve the integrity of the established from time immemorial religious and social life and rabbinism, Hasidim equally radically trampled the young shoots of secular education. And now the Jewish masses looked with horror and suspicion on the Russian school, not wanting to hear about it. In 1817 and then in 1821, there were cases in different provinces where Kahals would not allow Jewish children to be taught the Russian language in any common schools. Jewish deputies in St. Petersburg insisted that they, quote, do not consider it necessary to the establishment of such Jewish schools where no languages would be taught except Hebrew. 
they recognized only Cheder Elementary School in Hebrew, C-H-E-D-E-R, like Cheder without one D, and Yeshiva to increase and deepen knowledge of the Talmud, Cheder Yeshiva, or the Jewish schools teaching Hebrew. So there's a real conflict here between what transitions the Jews from these, these backward, completely almost anti-cultural uh, freak dress and weirdos what gets them from there to modern? Well, simply the, the ability to swindle is enhanced. And ultimately, that's what wins over the Kahal and the uh, and the rabbis. That's my view. They recognized only Cheder Elementary School in Hebrew and Yeshiva. There was a Yeshiva in almost every major community. Jewish masses in Russia were in a state of suspended animation from which they could not escape, despite the effort of enlightened educators. First, there was Isaac Ben Levinson, a scientist who lived in Galicia, where he was in contact with the leaders of the Haskalah and who worked with the rabbinate and also the perpetrators of many Hasidic troubles. Based on the Talmud and rabbinic literature, he argued in his book, Instructions to Israel, that the Jew must not be denied the knowledge of heretofore forbidden languages, especially the language of the state where they live, so necessary in his personal and public life. That familiarity with the secular sciences did not endanger religious and national sentiment. Levinson, again, Isaac Ben Levinson, or Burr Levinson, Bear Bar Ben all means son of, their middle name. And remember, they were forced by European countries to take last names. Before that, they had you no. Know, so it would be Isaac, Bear, Ben, Bat, whatever, Bar. Isaac, son of Levin, son, who is <laughs> himself son of Eleven. Zone means son in German, S-O-H-N. So they're, they're starting to say, hey, no, we do need this secular educator. We're going to live in Russia. We need to speak Russian, is what Levinson is saying. And that familiarity with the secular sciences did not endanger religious and national sentiment. Levinson taught that the predominance of commercial activities is contrary to the Torah and mind, and it is necessary to develop productive work. Before the publication of the book, Levinson had to use a grant from the Ministry of Education. He was convinced that cultural reform in Judaism cannot be realized without the support of the highest authorities. The Warsaw teacher, Gizianowski, on the contrary, G-E-Z-E-A-N-O-V-S-K-Y, the Warsaw teacher, Gizianowski, on the contrary, did not rely on the Talmud and strongly opposed it, attributing to the Kagalam rabbinate the, quote, spiritual congestion in which people live petrified, and that only, quote, af the after depreciation of their rabbi's power may be the secular school be introduced. Only after the depreciation of the rabbi power can you get them in the secular school. Melamidov, orthodox teachers, check and prevent the teaching of pedagogically useful and moral knowledge. The kahal had to be eliminated from financial management of the community, and the allowable age for marriage had to be raised. So basically, they're they're completely insulated. They're teaching them only this Jewish garbage. They're dressed in weird. Everything that will separate and isolate them. We've heard a lot about that in McDonald's uh, second book, or no, in his first book, and then what they shall dwell alone, and how how separate they are. So everything the rabbis did was aimed to keep them the same and keep them separated and isolated and under the control of the kahal and the rabbis. But now that they're being made fully equal citizens, they're going to have to emerge in the community. They're already parasitizing, but think of they can parasitize ten times better if they know the language and they know the customs and they dress the same and they they uh, work their way and infiltrate into it better, right? So that was the ultimate argument that will ultimately win. Although there's always different these different versions, there's still plenty of Orthodox who keep the strange dress and breed, but they also still treat cheat like the cars for kids scam where uh it's it's created by jews and they run it as public service announcements on the radio and then the money all goes to these dirty jews so in the end what's good for jews is is the leading the guiding principle here that ultimately even the rabbis will come around on even earlier both of them already mentioned Giller Markovich, G-I-L-L-E-R, Markovich, 
in a memorandum to the Minister of Finance, who wrote that, quote, for the salvation of the Jewish people from spiritual and economic decline, kahals must be destroyed. Non-Jewish languages should be taught to organize their factory labor and allow trade freely across the country and use the services of Christian. Now, are the kahals destroyed, or are they more or less reformed into the 1001 committees, the, the ADL, the AJC, the, the various other Zionist committees the Jews have effectively carry out the same functions. There's millions of Jewish 501c3s in the USA. And later in the 30s, it is largely the same, repeated by Chernigov merchant Littmann Feigen, and repeated more forcefully through Benkendorf and Nicholas I. Feigen was supported in bureaucratic circles he defended the Talmud, but attacked the Melamed, claiming that they were, quote, past ignorant, unquote. They teach theology based on fanaticism, unquote, and, quote, inspired children contempt for other sciences as well as hatred of the infidels, unquote. He, too, thought it necessary to abolish Cajals. Hesse, or Hess, serial enemy of the Cajal system, expresses that Cajal despotism was the, quote, dumb anger, unquote, in the Jewish people. However, longer in coming was any practical way to force through secular education in a Jewish environment. The only exception was Vilna, under the influence of her relations with Germany, and a group of Maskilim in Odessa, young capital of New Russia, with many Jewish immigrants from Galicia, porous borders, but inhabited by ethnic diversity and full trade movement. Here the Kahal felt strong and the intellectuals, on the contrary, felt independent and culturally merged with the surrounding population, including in their clothing and appearance. Even though most Odessa Jews resisted the establishment of schools of general education, the efforts of the local administration in the 30s and in Odessa and Chisinau achieved some success in secularizing Jewish education in those areas. Throughout the 19th century, the development of Russian Jewry had historic consequences for Russia and for all humanity in the 20th century. Through concentration of the will, Jewry was able to break out of still dangerous conditions, achieve a lively and varied life. By the middle of the 19th century, the revival and flowering of Russian Jewry stood out visibly. End of chapter 2 on page 77. This is recording number 3. And so, as bad as Jews are when they're under the kahal and under the rabbis and they're dressing weird and all that, at least they stand out. And that's one of the chief problems. When they don't stand out, they're harder to see if you've ever tried to talk, for example, to a conservative and point out. They often even have trouble spotting who's a Jew, let alone figuring out they've got an agenda. So to the extent Jews are different and separate, they make our job easier. That's where we're going to leave it today. And I said... It turned out to be, it was a few less pages, but I guess I had a little more to say. Anyway, everything we do at vnnforum.com, pieville.net, kirksvilletoday.com. I'm Alex Linder, and this has been recording three of The Crucifixion of Russia, a new English translation of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together. Thanks for being with me, and I'll be back with you again for more real, real soon.